a very good Thank morning you. and a warm welcome to respective dignitaries and one and all present here for a two day symposium organized by triple ad i am architect snehal kesarkar and i am architect sana khan will be your moderator for the next two days before we begin i would like to make a couple of announcements for the participants to ensure uninterrupted sessions all the participants are requested to mute your audios and switch off their videos if any question during the session you can drop your question into the chat box below and your your questions will be answered at the end of the session thank you for your kind cooperation and attention now i would request architect siddharth to play the video Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you, architect Siddharth. Dear participants, the present situation of COVID-19 and different guidelines of government of Karnataka and government of India gives us an opportunity to celebrate this Independence Day with responsibility. Independence gives freedom. Freedom teaches responsibility. While everyone likes to talk about independence, we would also like to discuss something else. That is interdependence. It's funny how important a concept it is. Yet it's a word we don't hear about very often. If you think about it, independence comes with me and interdependence comes with we. Interdependence is something that applies to our lives at every level, every aspect. We need each other. And our theme for the two day symposium is in independence and interdependence in architecture. We are privileged to have architect Krishnarao Jason, sir, and architect Dr. Gaurav Raheja, sir, with us. We welcome you, sir. Looking forward for the exciting, exciting session from you, and we are in cute delighted to have you with us today. Let me once again remind you all, architect Dr. Gaurav Raheja, sir, will be with us today and tomorrow with an enlightening workshop on architecture and inclusion. And the whole program is divided into three sessions. We'll have two sessions today, that is pre-lunch and post-lunch respectively. And we'll again continue tomorrow morning with the last session, followed by panel discussion with architects. A leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. I would like to welcome our beloved principal, Dr. K. N. Ganesh Babu, sir, who has been very instrumental to the organization's journey. Over to you, sir. All right. Thank you, Snehal. Uh, good morning and a warm welcome to one and all present here. I would like to take this opportunity to thank each and one, every one of you for taking your time off uh, for this two day symposium uh, titled Independence and Interdependence in Architecture. I would like to thank the speaker, keynote speaker for the day and tomorrow and our orientation speaker, architect Jason Sir, who has been very instrumental in giving a lot of meaning for this title. And uh, I would like to just share how this uh, title came up. At AAAD, we were all interested in organizing a symposium at the eve of uh, Independence Day, and that is how the word independence came out. And interdependence is to formulate a very simple grammatic rhyming word. That is how it evolved. And with this, when I talked to Jason, sir, my first discussion, he was asking, what is this independence and interdependence? So I, I was just sharing with him. Uh, sir, in a couple of forums, when I was uh, talking to uh, people from the industrial and the real estate background and IT back, people were all asking only one question. What is going to happen to architecture and the civil industry after COVID or after the pandemic? And each section, each sector, the representatives gave their own explanations that if business is going to flourish, going to pick up and so many X, Y, Z. And I had only one explanation for them. I told them, uh, as the IT sector has explained and as the agriculture sector has explained, architecture and real estate is actually going to flourish in the same way as other industries are going to pick up because architecture is very much dependent on the IT sector, on the agriculture sector and all the sectors on the humanity, on the humankind. And there is nothing to be suspicious about it or skeptical about it. Everything is going to be fine. As other sectors flourish, we are going to flourish. And that is how this uh, idea of interdependence came and uh, gave a little bit of meaning for this symposium. And uh, talking to Jason, sir, it was tuned and fine tuned and sir was getting into a lot of aspects which he will share from his own uh, perspective. Second, uh, talking to uh, Professor Dr. Gaurav, sir, uh, when I was explaining him the, you know, the topic, he was, uh, I, I should appreciate both of them readily accepted and appreciated the topic. And only thing, sir, uh, insisted was like dependence and interdependence, I would like to add a word called inclusion. It is only a different grammar, which will give a lot of meaning for the, for the program. And yes, we, we said the workshop is going to be on 
architecture and inclusion. Now, giving definition for a very simple grammatic word took a big shape by talking to these two gentlemen only for a few minutes. And I appreciate uh, the efforts and the, you know, the, the strong frequency spread by both the eminent speakers. Mm, today and tomorrow, according to us, is going to be a real informative session, a session where uh, Professor Gaurav sir is going to take us through the, you know, his expert subject of specially challenged and challenged and interdependence of uh, uh, humankind and relating that to architecture. And beyond this, I would like to uh, leave the session to the orientation of Jason, sir, without taking much time. I appreciate all the delegates who have, part have taken trouble to participate in this session. We will definitely do justice for this. And with this, I would like to pass on uh, the platform to Snehal for the further proceedings. Thank you and welcome all. Thank you, sir, for your support and helping us organize different events throughout the semester, even in these virtual times. The secret of getting ahead is to get started. So I would like to invite architect Krishnarao Jaisam, sir, for the induction. Over to you, sir. Namaskars. Good morning to all of you. Aditya Academy of Architecture and Design, and my great friend Gaurav, and the great other friend Ganesh, and you two beautiful ladies sitting in front. I have three more sitting behind me. Now, when first, as an introductory, when he used the word dependence and in independence, and then when I noticed the date was just before the day of independence, I said, there is there a political connection to this factor? That took me some time to understand, should I talk political architecture or should I talk an architecture that has much more deeper and greater meaning in life? Especially this dependence and interdependence and dependent now, he's added the word inclusion on this. I really wondered what is the post scenario that's going to happen. I'm very happy that I visited the Rootkey campus. I was very happy when they presented their campus. Now it looks very exciting and new. I'm hoping that get completed, finished, and they move into it early enough. I was talking to many young architects and other environmentalists on this. When you're talking about inclusive and in think here, the environmentalist immediately called me and said, sir, we have to look at the environment in a totality. Is it dependent on the urban infrastructure or is it not dependent on the urban infrastructure? And I like the word, when you use the word inclusion, yes, environment today, along with architecture, is inclusion with human society. You cannot run away from it. Another big aspect is architecture is a very fascinating profession. In fact, it's the most difficult profession which very few people understand. It is not just about human behavior and psychology. It's about every aspect of human life. What happens? Engineering solves problems. Engineering solves in technical problems. All the other disciplines solve the uh, built format problems. But it is only the understanding of the architecture and connection to the environment that makes it dependent and independent, that makes human behavior possible in a built space which is very crucial. Morning, I had a small mail from looking at the rivers and lakes of India. It is fascinating to look at water. It's fascinating to look at the sky and all the elements that make our senses work. That is what architecture is about. As I was going, suddenly I got the call from the Council of Architecture saying we are really looking at the entire format of architecture itself. So I asked Habib, I said, it's a very bold move. You will have a lot of objections coming from many people, but you must move forward in your fundamentals. I agree 100% for the first three years will be taken for learning the basics of architecture and the tools of architecture. Then the mind can really explore beyond oneself and lead into the what I call it, the abstract and the identity of the details. Many people wonder, is architecture detailed? or is it an abstraction? 
I say it's the most fascinating profession because when I talk to in the academy and other places, I always notice it is in the detail that the abstraction lies. And then they look at me and say, yes, sir, in the abstraction, the detail also lies. Which other profession has this integration so much happening? It is a very fascinating way to look at the profession itself. In, to a point, some people said, should we call ourselves environmentalists? You're environmentalist, but to the human being. Because many people say we are disturbing nature. This brought me another factor. When I looked at the ants and the bees that are around me, I wish I could take you around my little place where I sit, which is nothing but green, green, green. Sometimes you, you overlook so much of green, we're wondering why we have so much green around us. Then I look at the bees. They're all fascinating creatures of life, but they, if you notice, no two beehives are identical. No two birds' nests are identical of a species, yet they have a pattern. In this pattern, which if you don't read it properly, it looks like dependence. In that dependence, can you create an independence that is without losing the identity? Here again, I must mention only one hard factor. Human being alone is born with nothing and goes with nothing because he has to bring every aspect of human behavior into his life. And the architects have to really create these spaces for the human being because it makes a big difference to life. It's very easy to build buildings all over the place, but that is not life. Bringing life into this, I again use the word dependence and independent, whether it's political, is a bureaucratic, whether it's professional or it's very individualistic. It doesn't really matter. All this becomes inclusive. I'm with you on this. It's an extremely inclusive thing of using all the elements and the senses together and interact. Now, shall I push to another chapter of life? I was talking to one of the great philosophers and spiritual leaders the other day. They just said, somebody said, can we have this same thing tomorrow? One of them smiled and said, you can never have the same thing tomorrow. Tomorrow is different. Yesterday is over. Today is another day. Time moves and moves. You can never repeat a thing. You can never even multiply a thing. You can never even imitate a thing. Another aspect, this word imitation came into me in a big way. I find many architects out of, I don't know whether to call them architects at all sometimes, when they build spaces for human beings in the environment, they build identical ones, which is very sad because it, it solves a lot of technical problems, solves a lot of engineering problems, but it does not solve the problem of human being. It does not solve the sense of human behavior. Each individual, each individual family is an independent family, is an independent thought process. Look at the little child to the old person sitting there. It's so fascinatingly a drama, a drama of life, a dramatism that takes life beyond just now and then. This aspect must fuse into the environment for which each individual space today technically it is possible to create it. It is no you can look at history, you can go beyond 4000 years for culture, all the other aspects that make human evolution happening one after the other. What when you come to tomorrow, how do you fuse these things and take it forward? Yes, like what happened day before, there will be disruption, there will be sense of violence, there will be sense of this is where when I heard about Krishna, I said the sense of violence that brings Rama and Krishna and the Mahabharata and the Islamic things all together with the Christian world, all the various aspects of it come. That fusion is very important. Unsurprisingly, this most difficult of professions, the profession of architecture, is able to absorb all this and give an expression. I believe in this expression. I now take the last line on the thing. What is covered? Somebody asked, have you ever expressed, felt like this before? I said in a different way. I remember about 20 years back, 25 years back, there was some sort of another plague or something where I was totally isolated in my old room. Only my wife would be the only person who would come and attend to me. If I would attend to me, nobody else was even allowed to come near me, even forget now two meters. That was a whole floor. I couldn't even go to the other floor, other floor. That was a pandemic. We survived it. And then suddenly my mother said there was another pandemic before that. It is fortunately or unfortunately, it's technology that imagine if the technology of 
interaction was not there. We wouldn't even know about the pandemics. Even now, when I go to the villages, they all look at you and saying, these, these people, some kings coming and driving slavery on our heads, asking us to tie masks, tie this. Sometimes I wonder. But the understanding is through the fusion of the media. Now, the media can take you somewhere else. You must be careful of media. Media can help you. You, you must help them. You must assist them. They will assist you. If you leave them alone, they will what I found to you or laundry you all over the place. This is another big aspect. The architecture communication. This is another point I'm taking from COVID-19 and the space through which I call the narrow gash, the broad gash and space that opens up. For the first time in life, we can look at the profession in a very, very different way. Learning from home, teaching from home, but can you build from home? Can you go to that mastery? Can you go to that contractor and say, yes, I did sketch this way, but I think seeing you in reality, I would love to put it the other way because the brick speaks to you, the concrete speaks and the labor or the poor man, the technical real on the spot person. He is the man who really builds. This is another thing I've heard, I've learned about architecture. It's the only provision that is in total abstraction when it goes to the site. When it looks at it, you're totally dependent on everyone there. And you think you're independent. No, you're independent in your thought process, but you're totally dependent on even to the lady who carries the water and pours on top of it, or the person who's nailing the roof, or the electrician who's drawing the wire. If one of them goes back to your heart, if the bar is belt wrong, you're gone. Technically, you must know what you don't know, which is a very strange contradiction it appears like. We don't know the details of each profession, but we in must know the abstraction of the profession. That is going to become a very big factor in the future of our profession. Then I will not Hello. I would request all the audience to meet their audios. Okay. Group okay. <laughs> sir, sir, you have to unmute yourself, please. Jason, sir, you have to unmute Muted. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, no, the last conclusion. I think I'm, I'm waiting for my great friend to take on and go off. Then we will have great discussion tomorrow and gone. I welcome you all. I thank you very much for coming over. And I mean, physically may not be mentally you're coming over. And I want to sit with you on the thing. And thanks, Ganesh, and all AAD. When, see, when you use the word AID, suddenly it hit me, IID, it's AID, I said, really got, and all the ID, I sent them all, I said, come shut up and listen to A, I comes after A, or A comes after A. Thank you very much. Thank Precious. you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Namaskars. Thank you, sir, for joining us and giving such wonderful insights. To full support, humanity is cradle to grave. Architects must design with inclusivity and diversity in mind. Today we have Dr. Gaurav Raheja sir with us with his amazing workshop on architecture and inclusion. I would like to give a brief introduction about sir. Dr. Gaurav Raheja is a professor of architecture at Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. With over 13 years of teaching and research experience, he is also an associated faculty at the Center of Excellence in Transportation System and has been recently appointed as the coordinator of Design Innovation Center at IIT Roorkee. Driven by a passion for human-centric focus on built environments, he is guided by sociological and participatory approaches to urban and architecture reality. Also a copyright co-author of Universal Design India Principles. He has pursued his BARC from Punjab Technical University, Jalandhar, MR from Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee, and PhD from IIT Roorkee. His PhD thesis, Enabling Environments for the Mobility Impaired in Rural Areas, cited in World Disability Report 2011, published by World Bank and WHO. He, was, he has worked 
on some prestigious projects such as accessibility consultant to government of india for prime minister office new delhi railway station igi airport and central secretariat he has also been facilitated with several awards and appointed as daad research ambassador for south asia and india received daad and international fellowship from visiting researcher scholars at technical university at dampster tu berlin and university of duisburg germany he is interested in design thinking social inclusion universal design child and aging futures urban sustainability human centric design contemporary world architecture design pedagogy social and design research methods visual communication photo essays and storytelling he has been actively engaged and associated with anushruti a social initiative at iit roorkee for providing formal and vocational education to children with hearing disabilities largely from underprivileged communities in the region he has been chairman of the academic review committee at anushruti as well on behalf of entire triple ad team we would like to extend a heartfelt welcome to you sir i would now hand over the session to you sir <clears throat> thank you uh, so much uh, snehal and sana uh, am i audible just wanted to do a yes, check yes sir yes sir okay so i think before i really start uh, it's an honor a privilege and a heartfelt gratitude first to professor ganesh babu and the triple ad team also architect siddharth who've been coordinating with me uh, indeed an honor to fill your heart with words of uh, <clears throat> krishna jaisim sir uh, i don't know if i really have the audacity to say anything after he has said something because i'm still absorbing <clears throat> what he said and how profound it is when it comes from an experience of a man of his stature so i think uh, what i would say is that uh, you know the the experience of understanding independence interdependence or inclusion may initially sound very chaotic <clears throat> it may sound very disturbing also Uh, and it may sound very abstract at the same time but i believe i'm sure we are dealing with many youngsters here might even have to simplify these terms for them so i think in the next uh, one and two days whatever time we will get we will try to do justice with that by bringing in few strands of experiences that i think has shaped my way of looking at architecture <clears throat> and i must towards the end of my introductory thoughts must say that you know i owe every little thing of my thoughts to this profession this discipline of architecture i do not know how much of it i am able to practice in a in a commercial way but uh, or which i mean is in exchange of money but without that exchange as well i would say the kind of satisfaction that i derive in the beauty of abstraction of architecture i find it it's nothing less than spirituality to me so i would say uh, friends let's join ahead and take things forward word by word and so i think the whole communication that i'm going to do with you is all dependent again on the words that we use on the other side the words are not important but the words are the carriers of meanings so i don't know what actually happens in a classroom when you listen to someone uh, what is it that is transmitted why do we attend these workshops and i would ask you these questions so that you ask these questions to yourself because i think uh, in one single line uh, the the uh, they say that you know uh, when the seeker is ready the teacher shall appear right that's a old hindu saying uh, when the seeker is ready <clears throat> the oh, the teacher shall appear and the teacher need not be in the form of humans it can be in the form of environment it can be in the form of nature it can be in the form of many other forms right so towards the uh, end of this point uh, what snehal mentioned i think i'll begin with a story because she said that okay i have an interest in storytelling because i think lately i've started realizing that the whole profession the whole things have become so complex that sometimes the message doesn't go across without kindling the generations that we are interacting with 
So friends, let me start with a small story to connect you to the idea of independence and interdependence in a different way. <clears throat> so this is a small story about, you know, the elements of architecture. You know? So there are all these elements. There was a beautiful house which had a lovely roof, as you might have seen in Kerala architecture, a pitched roof with tiled roofs and a beautiful column, a kind of uh, a wooden structure. Uh, which hangs around to the purlins and, and towards the edges of those details and with a beautiful floor finished and some kind of beautiful frames, windows, everything, etc. And a beautiful family living inside it. Something that you call from a house transformed into a home. But one fine day, you know, these elements of architecture started talking to each other <clears throat> and they said, hey, I look so beautiful, you know, the roof set to the entire people. That, hey, I look so beautiful and because of me, this house is respected so much, you know, and that's the whole thing. So I am the real significant guy, you know, and I'm independent of all of you. <clears throat> so looking at this, the column said, oh my God, she's claiming too high a roof. I am also equally important. He says, look, I'm so strong in my strength because of which you strand and I am also an elegant and a beautiful element because of which this house and home uh, becomes an experience to walk in. At this, you know, the floor also started saying, oh, what is your existence without where the people will put their feet on? While people look at you, look at the beauty of the ceilings, look at the purlins, look at the columns, look at the roof, they cannot stand without me. So I have the beautiful floor, which is mopped up with a marble, with an elegant flooring pattern. So what about that? <clears throat> And at this, you know, this whole conversation, it started converting from a conversation into a debate. And at listening to all this debate, you know, all these elements started creating noise. Oh my God, I am the most independent. I am the most important. And without me, the whole existence of architecture in this house would not happen. And to this whole conversation, you know, a small tiny element called a nail between the column and the purlins was listening to this conversation and was starting to cry. He said, oh my God, everybody has a certain visibility. Everybody has a certain perspective. Everybody has a certain position in this entire house, which is appreciated. And I am the one who's neither visible and perhaps not even appreciated, you know, for my own existence. Now, how do I look at my own position in this whole thing? So at this departure of this thought from this debate, who could not even be invited to this debate as an element, the element called nail started to withdraw. Now, friends, can you imagine what happened after that? The moment it started withdrawing itself, <clears throat> you also understand the joints began to go loose. And as the joints began to go loose, things started to fall off, right? The tile started to wrinkle, the floor started to shake, the column started to stagger and the bulking happens. And eventually when all nails decided to move out of this experience, <clears throat> it was an experience of complete collapse. The point I'm trying to make out of this small story is there were so many invisible elements to which the visible elements depend upon. And this dependence and independence, I would say independence is an aspiration, but not a reality. Because at any given time, the most independent individual or even the system is actually dependent on something else. And therefore it is always an interdependent relationship, which somehow in architecture, I think we need to become more sensitive to. We cannot claim that we alone are sufficient, but yes, at the same time, we need to understand the environmental dependencies in different ways. To whom are you depending upon? I think unless we strike those chords in a beautiful way, the understanding of the networks of dependence, I don't think the success of architecture would actually touch our feet, right? So this is the narrative that I wish to begin the whole conversation upon and take things forward. So let me start, friends, with this uh, entire talk uh, title, 
I hope uh, you were able to listen to uh, the story so far because I, I get this, you know, jitteriness that whether I'm audible or not, right? Please give me a hands up if, if in case there is any problem, right? Okay. Uh, and also to the young friends who ever have joined us, you know, I really wish that we could interact uh, even in between a bit. Uh, and it's perfectly okay if somebody wants to jump in and say something, right? I'm quite okay with that. <clears throat> So I think, friends, uh, let's start in a black and white mode to ask a simple question, you know. Does architecture matter? Because we're talking about a spectrum between dependence, independence, interdependence, inclusion. I don't really want to confuse you with these words, but I want to come to these words in a deriving method, you know, in a deductive way, you know. So I'm not really asking you what architecture means to you, but whatever it means to you, my question to you is, does it really matter? And to whom does it matter if you think so? And if it doesn't matter, then why are we here? Right? I think this is a question that I would leave with you, but would like to come back at it at some point. You know, would anybody want to take uh, a chance to respond to this, to get, get into the debate? Any student? Anybody can be extempore about what, what is it that you're feeling about it. Does architecture matter? Do you think so? Do you have an experience of that in a daily life? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Uh, sir, I'm a fourth year student and I feel that architecture does matter. This is because yes. uh, the buildings that we live in, they, um, they reflect on how we feel. The buildings like if we live in a space that is like very depressing, we obviously will not feel like, you know, doing anything. We feel like just sitting in a corner and not um, like interacting with others. But if a building mm -hmm. like excites us, if it makes us mm -hmm. feel good, then we mm -hmm. as, a, as a person will be better. That's what I feel. <clears throat> and uh, do you require a building to make you feel good? Do you not feel good under a tree? It doesn't have to be a building like a built in totally enclosed space. It could be any environment that we are in that like uh -huh. architecture is not only about buildings. It could be natural as well. Mm -hmm. OK, I think uh, we are slowly heading towards the right uh, conversation. I'm happy. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your name bitter. I'm Sama, sir. Sama Hassan. Sama, Sama right. So, Sama, thanks for uh, chipping in your perspective. And anybody else wants to also share something? Maybe one more? Okay, in the absence of that, anyways, let, let me continue because I really don't wish it to become a monologue and you getting screwed to your chairs for one and a half hour just because I'm speaking. Uh, in between, I would even suggest you can close your eyes and still listen. That's perfectly okay, right? Uh, so the point is, friends, I'm, I'm not really going to lecture here, but I'm only going to share what I think, what I've been conversing, and I'm happy to be you know disagreed upon because i believe that's one sign that you're thinking right so anyways the question it still remains to me and when i'm asking this question to you i'm actually asking it to myself <clears throat> because there is a time in and out a debate you know that architecture is moving out of the hands of architects the technology is taking over uh, we are not required nobody pays the architects and so on and so forth but this question must come back to us in some ways. Then is it fine that the way the, we are doing architecture is going to continue? Or do we need to tweak a bit into this to really understand where we could head for, right? <clears throat> so I'll take the conversation further. Look at this, this built form, right? Of course, this is uh, a house designed by Tadao Endo, but uh, that's not the purpose I'm bringing it here. Uh, I would say, you know, I look at architecture in many forms a language. Before I look at it as a profession, I look at it as a discipline, right? Sorry. <clears throat> I am really looking at it as a discipline. And the discipline says, you know, that it's a, sorry. It's the language of space, you know. Unless you have the understanding of space, 
uh, and the elements that constitute the space, so whether you get light in through a glass or whether you get a floor punctuated out of this in a tight side, so whatever is this expression at the end of the day, uh, be it in concrete, be it in brick, be it in water, or be it even emptiness, it's a language that is composed around space, and we were discussing about the elements of space just a while ago. On the other side, as COVID has come into picture, I think even without COVID, it's just an expression on a street that I'm trying to show you to bring back this focus, you know, of the space in the square box. You know, what is this square box? The square box is perhaps uh, an extension of the human anthropometry with a distance which is guided by the context of COVID, isn't it? So these are not just mere geometric lines linearly. These are boxes which are also derived. And this isn't this also a piece of architecture to you, right? So at one stage, you might say it is black, so it is a street meant for vehicles. But how beautiful it is on the other side to suddenly see that people becoming the center of space. What else do you see? Just people. And this is something I wish to again bring back to this, that to me, architecture also is the language of people, you know how people live, what people do, and how people actually exist around. And if architecture can somehow, in a very subtle way, complement the language that exists, rather than enforce upon them something else, I would say that is the architecture that really matters. Unfortunately, we have a large variety of that form of architecture, which has mattered the other way, you know, it has disoriented the people's language. It has troubled the people more than actually helped them uh, achieve what their goals are. As a consequence, it becomes very important when I'm talking to you all friends, is about building these two words, you know, sensibility and sensitivity, right? And if in brief you want to say, it's about building sense with architecture. But the big question remains is, you know, who defines that sense, you know? Who decides? that whether this architecture is more sensible or not, or who decides whether this architectural experience is perhaps better than something else. Now, at that point, I would say, as an architect, you have a great freedom, and it is this freedom I think I'm deriving through this keyboard in terms of the directions that you take. You know, Before we jump to a conclusion about this is the form, this is the end outcome or something, I would say it is the direction that we take, and it's these directions, frankly speaking, actually shape the attitudes of the society, <clears throat> right? The A of the architecture, frankly speaking, actually connects us to the A of the society, which is the attitudes of the society. Because you'll see, for example, if the, if the streets are done in a particular way, how does the traffic move? Um, and do you keep blaming on one design or the other? But it's actually the attitudes of the society, right? Uh, why do we not have the same experience in Chennai as in Bangalore versus what is they're in the northern part of India. It's also, of course, there is a lot about design and planning here, but it's also important about what directions are we taking in. And why I'm saying this direction is important because I think the direction decides the discourse, the philosophy, the embedded, invisible, intangible components of architecture on the basis of which the built form, the regulatories, the, 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 the tangibles actually rest upon. Just like an example of the nail I mentioned to you, it is these joints. Joints means in the networks, you know, how are we positioning these interconnections? That's very important and critical. So, for example, what would you say uh, is the most critical element of any built form? <clears throat> to me, the most critical element would be the built form's entrance, because unless you enter, you cannot experience it. And many a times you'll find you'll find that we have done great, great projects, but the entrance itself raises a question that, sir, you are not welcome, right? And how does it happen? I'll give you an example of that. But the point when we are talking about the directions, you know, we have these two kind of parts. One is a direction that you go straight head on, you know, that you have to resolve a conflict and you, you really go head on. The other is you avoid the problem wherever it is and you find a way around it. While I would not say that you prefer one approach or the other, it is the context in which this understanding has to be placed by the architects that which perhaps would be a better choice to make. And that is when we go back to, you know, the idea of direction. So please understand these simple logics, these simple directions at every stage. I'm, I'm just trying to make you sensitive about these so that you ask these questions at every stage of your design thinking. 
And only when you're conscious about these directions, I would say the outcomes of that will be the similar fruits. <clears throat> the second point of, you know, uh, my conjecture at this stage is, you know, how are we looking at architecture as a term? You know, I would say, you know, does architecture matter again? I would say it, it wouldn't matter if there was no play of life in it, you know. And frankly speaking, it's not that architecture matters, it's life that matters. And in order to support that life better, architecture could perhaps be contributed. But the question is, have we been doing it well? Are people happy with us? Are people's lives becoming better by the kind of architectural contributions that we have made? And at that stage, I would say I would refrain to use the term architecture and jump into a bigger term that's called environment. Because I would say the architecture would matter if we could, in an in a invisible way, connect between life and environment. And by environment, I would say I have to uh, debunk this myth that environment does not only mean um, the green environment or the ecological environment. Please understand, we are uh, we are governed in a country, you know, we are run by a political environment. We are run uh, within our neighborhoods by a social environment. <clears throat> we are run into a retail store by a business environment. We are run into a school by an institutional environment, right? And the in environment itself is shaped by many things. Uh, it could be the laws, it could be the policies, it could be the tangible elements of them, and it could be the interplay between them. So, for example, your streets and public transport itself is an environment within which life happens. And unless, you know, we start looking at architecture with a connection with life, unfortunately, most of us, you know, would end up doing architecture as mere buildings. And that's a big challenge, which I think in 21st century, with these intellectuals that we are dealing with, I would say, we have to come back to. And if you think we matter to life, I would say only then we are required to be a profession that continues, right? The second is, you know, now how do we connect to this life with, with another invisible? That's about the attitude. The attitude is how we live, you know? So for example, how we live is how we behave in queues, how we study in our institutions, how we behave in public space, how do we move, how do we eat, how do we sleep, is all reflecting a kind of attitude. And this attitude you would understand, you know, is a transition from one generation to another. Today, for example, with all of us having handheld gadgets, reflects a different attitude towards things, isn't it? Uh, to the extent our attitudes towards knowledge have also got very different from what it used to be 20 years back. 20 years back, the dependence of knowledge was immense on books, on libraries, and on humans. Today, you would say, oh, I don't need to depend on you. I can join in a course, or a course, or this particular course, or an online education course, etc., and would still claim to be knowledge. In fact, that is going to be questioned in times to come about what is the relevance of human interface in teaching. I believe, of course, not because I'm transcending into that age, but I believe we could talk about that in a later spirit. But the question is, you know, therefore the attitude to education becomes very critical in terms of how do you learn about architecture with what attitude. So do you think, okay, we can do some 10 courses online, including the one like I'm talking about this, and can it shape an attitude? I would say we'll have to look at again this into the environment because the fact is the educational environment shapes the attitudes a lot. And the third is, you know, all these things are fundamental only when there is an access to it. Now, for example, uh, everybody has certain human needs, you know. So far we are assuming that everybody's needs are met and everybody has access to everything and then people are exerting the choice. But do you know, more than a billion people in this country of, of the great land that we're talking about do not have access to that environment that we talk about. And which is why I bring in this word called inclusion, you know. And what do I mean by, you know, this term access? I would, of course, it's not a very difficult word, but it can basically mean different things to different people, which will come to in a very definitive way as well. But here I want to actually share is that 
how do people access basics of life? For example, you're in home. Uh, just answer me, you know, uh, during the COVID situation, ever since the day lockdown happened, what happened in the first three days of this experience? That the next day you could not go to the college, you could not take out your scooty because there was a lockdown. What was the feeling, you know? What was the feeling? You were at home. Thankfully, you had groceries and you were getting food. What if you didn't have one? What if you didn't have access to medicine at that stage? What if your drinking water was off because electricity went off and you couldn't uh, get basically an AquaGuard uh, clean water? So what was the access about? You know, did you feel that? And I believe a majority of the so-called uh, people like us, you know, who were jumping with joy otherwise on every other day, perhaps were the first ones to get frustrated and started putting stories, you know, that how mentally difficult it is psychologically to be at home. Amazing paradox, isn't it? We design homes to be at home, but when we now got a chance to be at home, we were frustrated that, oh my God, how can I live here? I should have been in college. Because what? Because you now did not need access to food and clothing and shelter alone. You needed access to participation to life. You wanted to go to cinema to experience. You wanted to hang out with friends. You wanted to hang out maybe with your faculty. You wanted to do some experiments and do something else in your field. Even if none of this was a very, very fruitful activity, you might just have wanted to go for a stroll. Why? The question is, why would you like to go there? The question is, do as architects in our regular features ask these fundamental human questions? And even if we ask these questions, the question is, do we have the data? Do we really realize that how many people have this access to basics of life that I call them before we talk about advances to life, right? So look at all this and all this I therefore shape with actually these two words, the AI, which I know people would disagree with me because the AI today represents is artificial intelligence. But here I bring these three words to you is that the artificial intelligence can only work if it contributes to accessibility and an attitude which takes you towards independence, but it would even then would be interdependent. Would artificial intelligence work without electricity power? Would artificial intelligence work without a purpose? Uh, would artificial intelligence be great if people don't know how to use it? So would it be inclusive or exclusive? The point I'm trying to say is while it has become critical for us today as whichever stage of generations we are in, to at least be aware about, yes, the AI is the in thing, but this AI needs to be understood in a particular way so that the main purpose of architecture is not defeated. It should not make us cold in attitudes. It must not bring in us a kind of, you know, might that I'm so independent that one fine day when the disaster strikes and the power goes off, the AI doesn't work and the humans actually are trapped in that disaster even worse. You know, the idea of AI should not be to rob the humans of what humans have as independent features, but is to perhaps facilitate lives even better if they can, especially where there was no possibility of actually giving access. So I would say this, this term basically would be important is because uh, the AI is something which you can simply remember, right? The AI stands for <clears throat> the architecture of inclusion, which perhaps needs to create accessibility through an attitude of independence, right? And with this, now I, I move to the next question. <clears throat> so if architecture matters, the question is, does being an architect matter? So, okay, even if we assume that architecture matters, okay, built forms matter, spaces matter, greenery matters, ecologic matters, birds matter, everything matters. The question is, does my role of being an architect matter? What am I doing in that process in that case? Because who builds these buildings? It's the masons, not really the architects, at least in India, right? Uh, who builds the, the dwellings, etc., or who provides services? The services are provided by service engineers, be it a plumber, be it an air conditioning guy, be it a structures, whoever else, right? The question is, what is the role that we're going to play? If we think something matters, and there are a set of people who deliver that in practice, the question is, how is my role going to be there? So am I going to force upon them that, oh, I am an architect, so please give me a role. 
and people will say, okay, so take a role, you choose a role first. What would you choose? That the others cannot do. And that would be a very, very critical question. That would be a very critical question. And I raise this doubt, friends, to a generation like you, which is far more intelligent than what we were, you know, with very humble thoughts here, you know, I ask this question. You are a generation and sitting in Bangalore, I think you're even having greater access to this online shopping thing, right? So I ask you, you know, how do you buy things on Amazon? Without a reason, I'm promoting a brand, I guess, here by taking the name. But the perspective is, you know, when you buy anything, any gadget, and these days I'm told even groceries can be shopped there, how do you actually go about shopping something? You just punch in into the search engine and it pops you up with 10 things and then you say, okay, what is the cheapest? You just go about that. Perhaps not. I believe that you are a much more intelligent generation. So you also look at the star rating. You also look at the features. You also look at the zoom in features. You also kind of do a comparative and then you arrive at a decision making method to say, OK, I'm going to now buy this, invest this 500 rupees or 5000 bucks to get this thing. But my question to you, friends, here is <clears throat> when we talk about architecture, we're not talking about 500 or 5,000 rupees. We're talking about 50 lakh, 70 lakh, 80 lakh, 1 crore. That's the amount, right? Have you seen how the decisions are made in the procession of architecture versus the profession where you're buying a product? And a product has a shelf life of maybe one year warranty or maybe six months. And at the most, you will perhaps use it for three to four years, right? What about the piece of architecture that's going to come into existence? Uh, how long do you think is the life of that? And how do you think the decision making around that happens? And how do you think that passes on the benefit to the user at the end of the day? Because when you buy a particular product on Amazon, you also get a 10 day or a seven day send it back guarantee, right? If you don't like it, take it back. But what happens when you buy a house, maybe the ones that you're living in right now, paid some 70 lakh rupees, taking some bank loans, doing something else. And the question is, uh, how does that decision making happen? Do you get the star ratings? Do you get to see how the product would look and feel at the end of the day? Do you see it? Does it customize to your particular family needs? Professor Jaisim very nicely said, you know, every family is independent in itself. But when you do a housing, you know, every family gets the same set of house with no changes, be it in the kitchen, be it in the washroom, be it everything else. So we are living in a world, you know, we are trying to give identical solutions to different problems. And then we say, OK, well, it's your problem. If you like it, you have it. If you don't like it, leave it. Is that the way the profession has to go forward? And here I really urge that you know we can shift the way we have been as architects to the way we would like to be architects. We must combine the ethics of architecture towards providing the benefit of the experience of architecture to the public, to the people who actually matter. Because if it's not going to matter, I would say the business is going towards a business of cheating. As a result, the profession of architecture also is in an endangering time where people feel, oh, I will do it myself. And now with the Supreme Court's ruling, you know, that architecture is no longer a tag that would testify to you to be in the profession of architecture. It's important for us to redefine and reinvent how can we be more relevant. And I would say the only way we can be in relevant is if we start touching lives in a better way in a more meaningful way and in passing the benefits of design to actually the users where their lives and their quality of lives really get better, which a mere engineering <coughs> service provider or a mere mason or a mere carpenter would not be able to provide because you would have perhaps the holistic understanding. So my, my simple fundamental appeal here is that the, the, the understanding of architecture requires a very, very holistic approach while having a microscopic eye to details which perhaps can even be abstract and can even be functional at the same time, right? So I think this is something where I connect you to what Victor Papanek said many years back. I don't know about uh, if you really uh, know this guy. Uh, Victor Papanek authored this book. You know, I don't know if you can see my camera. Uh, it's called Design for the Real World, right? You can Google it and find it out. 
Uh, but what he said, you know, and, and it's something very important because he was also a design educator. He was a designer and also an architect and an author of this book, which remains as a Bible in most design schools across the world. <clears throat> so what he said was that the main trouble with our design schools seems to be that they teach too much design and not enough about the ecological, economic and the political environment in which design takes place. I'm not taking this statement as a face value of, you know, just to replicate this, but I'm just using this as a, as a point for us to think. Yes, design is amazingly critical, whether we pay it for not or not, because if we design only as an imaginary thing on piece of paper, yes, people don't like to pay for it today because they expect a service of translating this design into reality, right? And for that, we need to take the pain because from that paper imagination to its reality, it won't happen unless we understand the interfaces of the various environments that it's going to be passing through. So it's going to be passing through the environment, which is ecological. It's going to be passing through the environment of costs where the economy has to come into picture. And it also passes through the environment of politics. Politics does not mean the parliamentarian politics, but the politics of society, you know. How do you build? Where do you build? If you extend a balcony here, the water drips. Somebody has a problem here. If you build it around the roadside, you're killing somebody's shelter there. You're encroaching upon something. You're taking upon nature. So there is a politics around life, right? And this also needs to be understood from a very social lens. Somehow in the past several years that I have been trying to work, I mean, it's, it's only out of interest, only out of some kind of compulsive uh, fascinations that I began to take, or you can say, become more sensitive towards a social lens of architecture because I found it so interesting to learn from people. And then very nicely, I would say, I would say I know nothing. And then people can teach you so much. And then around that, if you can mix around an architecture using your some creative impulses, I would say you can make a lot of sense. But it is time that I think uh, when uh, Professor Jaisim says that uh, the Council of Architecture is ready to relook I would say they must surely relook, hopefully, with this statement in mind that how do you how do you impact upon the pedagogy of architecture in the classrooms so that we can be more relevant to the environments of future that we're talking about. So I think as, as part of this workshop, you know, as we are going, we've already started, of course, I'm just bringing here is four questions, you know, <clears throat> whatever we are discussing, what does it really mean? Why are we constantly talking about it? What can we do, therefore, and how does it really going to shape? So how do we really go about it, right? So let's go forward, friends. Here's a image, you know, which is a typical image. And also I'm, I'm bringing a few images from the West also to kind of tell you because I've, I've done a lot of Indian imagery. Uh, and because in India, we look at the environment in a very different way. You found certain perspectives missing or certain perspectives there. So I don't really wish to show you these images to bring any comparative perspective here, <clears throat> but want to give you a perspective from a world that is <clears throat> also shaping architecture and sometimes we take their references. <clears throat> and also wanting to bring examples from there that uh, how those invisible elements shape the attitudes. So here is a signboard to a newly designed housing in Netherlands, which is now maybe four or five years old. But you see, this is the kind of signage, right? Now to, I'm sure 95% of people, it would not even matter. They'll say, oh, fine, this an arrow and, and let's just go ahead. Now maybe those 5% people to whom it might start mattering could be the ones who <clears throat> might uh, be in the category as it mentions is entrance disabled, you know? Uh, we are talking a little about the language English, not that we, are only endorsing it for any reason, but it's just a communication language for us right now. So you see this, you know, that uh, uh, <clears throat> that the entrance disabled as a term, what does it mean? On the other side, it writes an arrow. On the first one, it says the main entrance. So first of all, if you see in a deductive logic method, the sequence of writing an entrance, the main entrance, the main entrance is for whom? Main entrance is for the main people, right? And the entrance disabled is for whom? Well, the entrance itself is disabled, isn't it? 
Now, if the entrance is disabled, why should I go on the right side? And on the third side, we know no matter what we write, we read it as what we think. So we read it as entrance for the disabled, right? Now, I want to little bit of, you know, derive a bit of sensitivity here that what do you mean by the term disabled? So, okay, when I'm driving a car or am I walking on a foot and I read this, so if I take a right turn, what does that mean? Uh, so it means that I am a person with disability and therefore I'm using this entrance. I know semantically they did not mean all this, but what it actually means is all this, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. And this is what we as architects, designers have to be very sensitive about this because this, this board is a manifestation of the expression of the physical form of architecture. The physicality of the architecture decided that, okay, this is where the entrance is going to be and that shapes the entire thing. And which is why I mentioned in the beginning that to me, the most critical element of any built form would be its entrance. Of course, I know there are all the other elements which are maybe even more important in some sense or the other. But I'm just using this term to explain it in some form of, you know, as an example, illustration that the entrance itself defines what will be my impression about my invitation. So if you go to your institution, you know, and one fine day you break your leg or you are in perhaps in not a big good situation and you perhaps don't have an entrance which can take you in, you would be lifted into it. Maybe you don't mind, but some people may mind. And the question is, if every day you have to be lifted, what is happening is the architecture is increasing your dependence on human support. And which in turn does what? It actually lowers your dignity. The fact is, friends, dependence decreases dignity by a simple human cultural notion. And this is global truth. So it's the same in the US, it's the same in the Europe, and it's the same in India. Nobody, even a beggar, would not like to depend. And therefore, I must tell you, it's very, very painful to beg. It's very painful because you have to depend for one rupee on someone else, for your bread on someone else. Amazingly painful, right? Likewise, we have to see here as an architect, as a sensitive architect is, does my architecture relieve people from their pain of depending upon someone to the extent it is possible, right? I would urge friends to be sensitive about this because this is where it becomes important is to connect. So there is no word architecture that I'm using here. I'm just using here as a word is, is the understanding of the human and the environmental interface, right? Friends, let's get ourselves free from big jargons of architecture, inclusion, etc. Just try and say, we are the people who can make the relationship between humans and environments better to the extent that it could be as far as possible, give them the feeling of independence and can restore the dignity of doing things. You know, you know what, even a small child, you know, when he or she starts walking, right? Uh, <clears throat> The moment he, is, he or she has learned walking, he wants to resist holding a hand, right? And likewise, you see an elderly. I know when my father underwent a knee surgery and uh, in seven days time, he was given a walking frame, walking stick, etc. I could see the urgency, even in an aging body, that how early he wanted to leave all that because he didn't like to take supports, right? It's a, it's a pursuit, so please understand any form of support that you and I need is a support. And can that support be provided in an invisible way? To many of us you may not realize, those who are using spectacles. Now what is a spectacle? A spectacle is a corrective support or an assistive support for the human eye so that you can interface with the environment with good visibility while ensuring that your eye definitely has some loss of its visibility, isn't it, or sight. And that is corrected in such a way that the spectacles have become a norm. They have become extensions to a human body. And would you like to call that an assistive technology? So you would assume, and just imagine when you don't find your spectacles early morning or late in the evening or during an important session or something, suppose you have to watch a train ticket on your mobile phone and, and something else. Uh, and imagine if your spectacles are not on or they break. 
what kind of dependence you get on. If you have to read a medicine, you know, and take whether I'm taking the right medication at the right time without spectacles, imagine the kind of dependence that we're talking about. And here also, you know, giving the right kind of natural light, artificial illumination and design sensitivities can still matter, you know. So it doesn't take away from our responsibilities of being a designer. And this is where what I'm trying to say is let's start looking at this relationship. And this we cannot do unless we start observing, intercepting and engaging with this relationship on a daily basis. I would say while COVID has been a global pandemic, a challenge, a very huge, huge, I would say human disaster, I would say let's look at the beautiful opportunity that it has created is for at least six months or so, we have the wonderful opportunity to look at the human environment interface at least within our own homes. And therefore, as part of this workshop, I would wish that we bring out some learnings from these experiences in the next couple of hours, right? And within which you have both the built and the unbuilt, right? As talking together. Here are some examples which I'm trying to give you in a very unnatural way. So you see a staircase, but you might see a staircase is something for everybody to climb up and down. But you might not really imagine that this, this is also that happens on these staircases. Not that these people are complaining, they are fit and fine, they can lift it. And look at the baby, you know, he's enjoying uh, the ride. But looking at little suspicion, hey man, please make sure that you're carefully taking me down. But on the other side, when you see this, <clears throat> look at the relationship of dependence and independence, right? While staircase is a flight of steps which makes you independent to climb the next level, for someone else, it becomes a limitation. And on this, they have to start depending upon. So the baby anyways was dependent, uh, but the baby and these people have got further dependent. And for many other people, you will find uh, different other forms of dependencies that come into picture. The second point is, you know, is about how do you design these staircases? You see, uh, there's a tread and the tread itself has three colors, a light gray, a dark gray and a yellow. And even the fourth one on the riser, which is the black, you know, and you know, why is that? <clears throat> it's because I, I think I just gave you an example of the the optical ideas of, of the vision. Uh, here is an example of, you know, a lot of people with low vision, you know, amongst us, uh, low vision is a great disability but a largely ignored one because it's invisible because people who have low vision need not have spectacles and sometimes those people even would be ignorant about it, but they cannot distinguish the colors, you know, and when you see these flights, especially when you climb down, there have been many cases when people have fallen down. Of course, those accidents are never reported in, in any big media report. Uh, as a consequence, I'm just trying to tell you here is that architecture has been a reason many a times of many injuries and accidents uh, besides being supporting. So uh, on one side, we are trying to design architecture in a way that it makes lives more independent. But on the other side, many a times, if you look at it in a very honest way, the environments that we have designed have been responsible for bringing people into complete dependence. In past three months, I know of at least four cases in my vicinity within my campus, you know, who have had slip injuries, making them bedridden for at least one to two months by slipping on the floor finish that they had in their own houses, right? Uh, one of them happened in a washroom, but the other uh, uh, slips that I'm aware of happened in practically in their living spaces because of some droplets of water on a tiled floor make them do so. And many a times on white floors, you don't see the white or the colorless water and as a consequence, the low vision leads you to that problem as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I just got a one phone call. I'll just, just uh, call it off. Yeah, sorry. So, <clears throat> so as a result, you know, this is an example from the London Tube. Uh, this is how things matter. Another case, you know, have you seen, have you ever traveled in Bangalore with uh, these buses? Of course, now you've got Nama Metro to, to some extent, sorry. Uh, do you call it Namma Metro or which Metro? But it is a Metro. I've, I've also traveled it uh, on it. But the point I'm making here is, do you have, say, for example, classmates with you who might be using wheels and coming to institutions like that and using public transport? 
or maybe coming on their own uh, do you have people around you in your homes who might not be as able as you maybe a grandparent maybe someone else maybe by virtue of an accident or something if not i think i want you to ask that question that it is great luck that you don't have one yet but what is the chance that one could be in that situation then because this is a question that the architects have to ask because uh, com- coming back to the question i raised about the amazon product of 5000 rupees which has a lifetime of like 2 years to 3 years you're talking about products of infrastructure which are like 100 crores 1000 crores uh, the bangalore streets the bangalore metro the bangalore majestic public uh, uh, bus station right uh, and the the sidewalks around it the shops around it the retail experience the mg road the whatever so whatever be it a public space be it the lal bag botanical garden be it the isro space be it the vishveshwarya museum or whichever center of bangalore that you want to talk about and including your own institution <clears throat> the question is are you free and independent to move there at any given time anyhow and just look at this as what is it that you depend on you depend on money you depend on getting out of your own house so can you step out of your own house given a situation that one fine day for some reason or the other you are not able to walk how do you go to the hospital forget about anything else how about going to a hospital nearest to you such that you get a good facility so i would say the, this question actually brings us to to a center stage to understand you know a lot of human side of it I know in the architectural syllabi curriculum we need to spend a lot of time in understanding materials we understand a lot about form we understand a lot about color we understand a lot about these elements construction details etc but i would really urge even if it's not the responsibility of an institution but it's our own responsibility as an architect to spend a lot of time in understanding one simple question that is what does being human mean right and if the human means only one thing why is every other human so distinct and different and if you start seeing that difference in the humans not as a difference per se but as a diverse form of existence i think you could actually start enjoying it friends tell me very frankly do we not enjoy a garden when it blooms with multiple colored flowers have we ever seen a tree which has even two is two similar exactly the same leaves it perhaps none even if all of them are green but what happens when it comes to humans who perhaps exist in multiple forms you know to the extent you don't even want to make friends who doesn't think like you right why does it happen that people want always the same kind of people around them i think that's a big anomaly in the human existence and i wish to question that especially as an architect when you know that two people whether friends or foes or people envious of each other are going to be in the same space how do they behave together so that they can come together and at that point does the architecture that i'm talking about enable them enable their participation or does it actually disable them so if you see here in this conversation it's a it's a guy on a wheelchair which is fine it's it's just as good as your own feet right and this is a bus which is also a box on a wheel right now these two wheels have to interface with each other but that's where the problem begins and you'll find in india we still have struggling with these basics which perhaps i would i mean many organizations uh, because this has been oppressed neglected ignored and not taken care by the people who designed or have mattered in the creation of infrastructure i would say time has come that people have started talking about it as a human rights issue right and so today the the idea of architecture is not merely to satisfy you know the user user goals in some form or the other today architecture has come to a point that the public and the society is increasingly aware so you youngsters who are so aware about everything just on a whatsapp or youtube or twitter etc are also must be aware that today's laws and legalities have also been entrusted upon us so if you are found guilty at some point or here or the other you'll find there's a huge challenge that you will have to deal with in the practice of architecture right so it is an example from the french railways you know incidentally once i was there uh, on on paris station and you know you see this sign called sortie right 
uh, maybe those of you who know French would understand that it means exit. But I know when I was trapped in a metro station in Gare de Lyon in, in Paris, uh, <clears throat> this sign was written in blue, right? I kept on circling around it for almost half an hour uh, to discover where is the exit from that metro station. And just two days before that, there was a Nice terrorist attack uh, in, in France. So I was shit scared, you know, of how do I find an exit? But what I was looking at was a language and a translation of that language in the language that I could speak, which was at least English, right? And here you find, so cultural aspects of design can also increase dependence. And that was not a society where I could ask anyone, unlike India. So India is an amazingly inclusive society in many forms, unless you take away its, its certain uh, evils of its past, but uh, people are extremely friendly, they are able to support each other, but at the same time, the infrastructure also has to do its job, friends. So while in being in India, I think we are greatly benefited by the fact that we have so many people so that you can you know, seek information and support. But at the same time, it should not mean that if a build form or an infrastructure is missing or is not doing its job, you're always trying to depend on people around you, right? So if you look at this, even a language and a sign, and now it's an exit, now where does this wheelchair go? <clears throat> Uh, in, in recently in the month of January, I remember I was walking down from a metro station in Delhi. Uh, somebody had given me an appointment and I kind of took a one uh, hour of train ride, uh, interchanged on another station. <clears throat> and now because of WhatsApp, so we say, okay, I will reach exactly at this time. So I did reach the station on time. But to get out of the station where that gentleman was waiting to discover that exit took me at least half an hour. And I remember the security guard in Delhi Metro telling me, sir, don't look at the sign, ask us, because we are here to tell you. I said, amazing, that human support is so welcoming, but we can't still deal with, you know, signage system as part of this. <clears throat> Likewise, you'll see uh, another form of uh, inclusion or exclusion uh, debate. Uh, what about the train journeys, you know? So you'll find Indian trains have this kind of a separate coach, which writes that it is for people with disabilities uh, and of course uh, here is a picture of my friend Shivani who was living in Puttapati uh, near near Bangalore I would say uh, who's experienced such kind of discrimination many times and uh, the question is how do you expect her to travel in this and what if she travels in this the question is where will her caregiver is going to be and second this is not a reserved compartment the question is, so our entire transportation infrastructure, which is around taking two crore people every day uh, in trains, uh, except for these COVID times, you'll find there's a huge investment of cost, but there's a huge set of people now which is excluded. And I want to give you that list of exclusion, friends. It's not just about the trains. It's about infrastructures, right? And in the shaping of these infrastructures, it's the invisibles that are going to question. <clears throat> Here is somewhere else, you know, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, down south, I deliberately took this picture, where uh, access was created in a particular way. We'll come back to this maybe to understand what, were, what really went wrong here, right? And discuss these kind of things. So I'll give you another example here from uh, the city of Venice. Uh, in fact, I was here, there's a city of Venice, as you know, it's all on canals, beautiful, lovely, nice uh, pitched roofs. And almost in a span of like 70 to 125 years, you know, uh, the city got a new bridge, which is, you can call it a contemporary bridge, you know. It's a city of bridges otherwise, which are all old bridges. So this is the main bridge around which, you know, uh, the whole discourse of mobility and inclusion was centering because this bridge connects you to the bus station and that bus station connects you to the airport service, right? So if you have to actually walk into the city by the bus, if you come from flight, you will have to take this bridge. So every tourist will practically have to pass through this bridge and this bridge has a series of these steps and these steps are actually made of partially of glass uh, as well as a in-between paved uh, way of some kind of a concretish material. Right, now this was designed by Santiago Calatrava uh, in 2008 and there was a 
huge lawsuit on him because of the cost inflation that happened, you know, while it, it was under construction. So it went like 4 million euros extra the cost than it actually was planned for. And you can imagine, which is why I say the economics, right? But at the same time, you know, you'll find this bridge came into huge news uh, that it injures so many tourists who suffer tremendously by virtue of this design, you know. It's an urban design, it's an interesting structural design, it's a contemporary design, so it's a language of style, it's a language of time, it's a language of people, it's a language of technology, right? And that's a piece of architecture because it's a language through which you get the identity to the city as well. And as people move here, you know, everybody walks in with luggages. You, you can imagine what the city of Venice is like, right? And what happens is people once in a while, they trip over it because the steps became slippery. Also, the steps started to break down. And then, you know, somebody filed a lawsuit that, okay, that this bridge does not allow elderly and people with disabilities to cross this, you know, so they can't even come to the city. Uh, so what happened is, as an afterthought, a solution was planned, which was called as this wheelchair pod. So right next to this bridge, they built a structure and in which, you know, they put this technology here so that you can wheel in and which is now available from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. The question is, what is this kind of a solution? So which means that if you come and, you know, with a person as a family, somebody from the family who cannot move is going to be packed into this uh, um, so-called, you know, a UFO kind of an object uh, and you would kind of come back from this. So you can see the steps. There is a kind of glass here. Uh, and there is a kind of concrete edge uh, towards it. Now, you know that glass and steel have been becoming the materials of the century, but these materials also need a sense and sensibility, where to apply and when to apply. Uh, so no offense on Mr. Kalatrava, but what I'm trying to say, an aware society did not let Mr. Kalatrava go free. Just one year back, you know, the courts of Europe uh, have actually announced a huge penalty of around $87,000 or euros on Mr. Kalatrava for making an inaccessible bridge in the city of Venice. It took again 10 years there also to get this justice, but what I'm trying to say is that the architect was found guilty of neglecting this. He is defended for cost, he is defended for construction quality, etc., but he's not able to defend the idea that why this was not done in time. And these are pictures, of course, which I remember. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's an architecture where the, the language of space the, talks to you about how would you depend on. In India, you may sometimes have a coolie or a porter who will carry your luggages. But this is actually, if you see this guy with a backpack and two suitcases, this is just small. I think I had many more pictures. Even I had a bigger luggage. Uh, you can see a child and a mother. You can see a baby pram and everyone else. So tourists are going to be in all shapes and body sizes and all cultures and all behaviors. And this is just an example, not to really pinpoint Venice, but to pinpoint that we might even have 10 times more such examples where it doesn't really work. And I know of many examples from our own context, you know, where to arrive at a lift, we have given three steps before the lift, right? And this is the sensitivity that I'm talking about. So you'll hear, uh, you see, that the court said that there had been errors in its design and was meant to have cost 7 million euros, but it ended up in 11.6 million. <clears throat> and then it was lacking the access to wheelchair users as a consequence of which it was fined. The, the architect was fined a huge amount of penalty on this. Now, friends, so at the same time, therefore, I'm try trying to talk to you about is when you look at an environment, start looking at it, this as elements. So that when you invite a set of people, just like this duckling that you see here, uh, you would have done a very good job of designing an environment. But what happens to a certain set of invisible people, you can also figure out from this kind of a, <clears throat> a humor-based illustration. But frankly speaking, this is the reality. Be it when you do an urban context of design, uh, of urban furniture, when you do a urban street crossing, when you connect between a metro and an interchange terminal, when you do a auditorium, when you do many other things, for example. So I would ask you even a question of, 
uh, where have you seen a nearest public accessible washroom for people who actually walk on the street side? And can we have better ones? I am aware that uh, Bangalore has been a city of entrepreneurs, startups, and we would rate it as one of the most intellectual cities of, of our country, which we are very proud of. And therefore, I know that uh, Ms. Sudha Murthy had been taking some initiatives in public toilets, which is an area of my interest. So I would really wish to know from you that if there have been initiatives where in Bangalore they have succeeded as well. So friends, this brings me to a slide which I believe you might have been seeing since past, ever since you've joined this graduation or maybe since school, you know. The point I'm trying to make here is because there's a lot of talk today about what is called a sustainability. <clears throat> but I want you to slow down a bit, you know, uh, and look at these 17 goals very, very consciously with great care. And look at the each goal, you know, because I know most of us center around goal 11 or goal 13, right? Or maybe goal 7, uh, because we say, oh, yes, we have to reduce the energy consumption. Oh, we have to make sustainable cities and we have to do something to do uh, climate action, right? Yes, I think these are the major ones that we come to the classroom discourse. But I want to ask you, if you really look at sustainability, friends, start making the connect between each of these goals, each of these goals, because we can be responsible for all of this. So again, the question, does architecture matter? It matters only if we can contribute to these 17 goals. Can architecture matter to no poverty? You would say, okay, what have we done to do with poverty? Well, poverty and you can connect it to economics, isn't it? So it's about including the poor in terms of the experience of architecture. Uh, including the idea of food so that there is no hunger. So can there be waste methods? Can there be plantations? Can there be growth in some form that nobody goes for hunger, you know? Can architecture contribute to good health? I believe so much more than hospital design. We can. Can we contribute to quality education? Yes. Do you know that thousands and millions of children in India do not receive this education because they don't have access to it? Now, access on one side I mean is physical and on the other side I mean is content based and as an architect i would say even if you strip the term architect as a design professional i would say we have immense possibilities to contribute to this in multi-scaled models look at the gender equality perspective do you think our streets are safe for gender why is it so and i i really admit this and i must say this that uh, we have been a male oriented society for many years you know and it's, it's a very big shame to, to look at our own selves, you know, that we have dominated like that. You know, it's very painful to see the history of our own country in that form. But I don't think, you know, now the question is why a woman cannot walk after 7 p.m. in particular streets? Why are public spaces so-called considered anti-cultural for women to, to go into that space? And we have to, a public transportation is not safe. In fact, I know many people chose to shift to Bangalore because Bangalore showed much greater resilience and was considered to be more gender equal. Uh, I don't know if, if, it's, if I'm wrong, but I believe Bangalore had been a kickstart of a lot of transformations in India, though I think there are still much more that are required. But these are questions that we have to ask as architects. Can a woman feel safe and can you design a space in which safety can be embedded? It's not an easy question. You would say, I'll put a lamppost and, and that will take care of it. Well, it won't, you know, and you'll find here you'll have to understand the networks between public space, activities, design, and again, dependence and independence here. On whom does a vulnerable section of a child depend? So I think uh, we have been doing some research on children independent mobility in India, uh, especially we did some work in Delhi as well as now in Calcutta to understand uh, if a child is not independent to move on Indian streets, I don't think those streets would actually work for anyone else. And then we come back to this debate of Jane Jacobs that uh, the streets are designed for vehicles and not for people, which is so sad. So it's about how, how can the architecture of the future bring people back to space, right? Access to clean water and sanitation. Can you give me a solution that uh, we could have a housing without the aqua guards? Why do I need to have this gadget-based architecture, you know? Uh, it was not required. It is still not a necessity. But the clean water and sanitation is an important challenge to which architects can think about. 
because on one side we are using materials like silicon and other toxic materials which i would say will even make your groundwater become infected and on the other side we try to put some kind of you know purification systems within home which changes the ph value and actually has altered the body internal compositions if you actually do these studies which nobody will tell you when they sell these products but i think as an architect it's important to look at water and architecture as well in that sense seventh is the renewable energy we are talking a lot about energy but my question is uh, how do we learn architecture today or how do we learn anything in school are we not becoming too energy intensive in anything whatsapp consumes an energy you know it consumes the battery and the battery is also needing a charge so any exchange of video any exchange of audio and so do we even think when we send a certain message that it is a consumption of energy because this must connect to uh, goal number 12 <clears throat> so how can architecture build in a behavior of responsible consumption you know this can happen if people are staying closer to each other if the societies are becoming better but on one side the technology has uh, connected us digitally but it has disconnected us socially and physically so you'll have to look at this and if we were engaged socially and physically we would not have been using the electrical energy but we would have been recharging ourselves physically and perhaps for better health right then look at other sections of this you know even jobs economic growth etc so those can also be possible if we start using local materials rebuild the local skills on the other side because it's i'm talking especially about india centric architecture you know uh, because you have to address the country's issue we may have robotics at the same time at the same time the local masons also exist but are we empowering them or are we completely shifting to a turnkey architecture that's done by machines and without understanding all these features one by one in detail etc we cannot create an architecture which is independent right when we talk about even net zero building it's only about independence of energy it doesn't talk about independence of other forms right so i would say yes independence is a pursued goal but many of these goals which are un, i would say misrepresented or are not connected by architecture usually uh, becomes i would say another gap of the sustainability and here you will have to again answer this question who am i actually designing for the yellow is the idea of difference while the black is the idea of similarity but is identicality the answer that we are looking at <clears throat> so a question that we come back from the history of architecture is we were always shown there is a vitruvian man again a gender bias i i object to that at least with the knowledge that we have today there must be a vitruvian woman as well if we if we could so but i would say it is still sad that we still look only at the vitruvian man or a vitruvian woman what about the indian man and the indian woman you know we don't have even the anthropometric data of them till date right in a form that we can use it there have been some studies here and there but we still don't know what would be the average height what would be the statistical mean of that what would be the standard deviation of it to really understand when you design internal spaces external spaces furniture uh, primary schools kindergartens now with the new education policy you'll have new infrastructures getting converted into education and all the question is what guides it so i would say indian architects have to be extra intelligent because they have to do things ad hoc but here what i'm trying to say is your generation can contribute to this even by that small significance by conducting studies friends the study the intellectual study can be a contribution to the whole profession but let us see that somebody takes that so here we connect you know that the vitruvian man which remained for many centuries the the whole idea of design you know the whole idea of central thing <clears throat> the question i ask you is who amongst us actually possesses the height the body dimension and the physique of a vitruvian man such that the rest of us can actually be shaped by the same dimensions and the answer you will find is <clears throat> most of us <clears throat> don't fit this circle any at any given time of our lives the second thing is you achieve this particular age and stage only once in your lifetime which may last for maybe 2 3 5 years before that and after that you're all the time actually either a child or somebody or the other who is growing up or who is actually growing down which means you are aging uh, or uh, become 
whatever you can say enjoy the phases of life right so this is again where i'm trying to bring in the debate of inclusion in the circle please try in the circle fit or you can say try and make as many circles of people as you like and then say does each circle find its way in the piece of architecture and that is that is a result today you know that you'll find many restaurants have started keeping a baby chair you know uh, earlier the babies were not expected to dine or they were supposed to be in the lap of a mother again a gender based formula uh, but today we'll have to shape it up <clears throat> second debate if you can take it forward is about the absence of a baby changing station in a in a male washroom in a public uh, restroom why and which again re results into this gender specific uh, dimension that we still expect only women to take care of kids right and that is again a challenge that we'll have to talk about and these are the social inclusion aspects of architecture which we have to first look into question them and then take things forward so my appeal and a perspective to you is is that look at architecture for the people who are maybe diverse but look at them not as different but as unique you know the idea of diversity is to celebrate that we are all different unique and originals and we do not have a second to us yet there are connections within us around which the principles of design can actually happen so when you look at the idea of inclusion you know friends we have to look at many dimensions i know the debate of uh, inclusion has started picked up around the world is around centering around the issues of ability so here i would like to ask you a question how do you define your own abilities you can solve a mathematical question you can be very creative about certain things etc etc but how do you look at other aspects and does it not really happen that in different phases of life you at least age and by being from one particular gender you have certain kind of body issues which are unique to you there is no question of calling them as uh, you know uh, any form of uh, negative tone but a point where you have to respond to that uh, what about the economic status it's okay to be uh, not wealthy uh, but what happens when you are actually from a certain status does that person become independent uh, what happens when you come from a different nationality and i can tell you here when i have experienced in france and all so the language became an issue especially when you are following public transportation right uh, what was the issue when you look at culture now the culture here is is very distinct i'm talking even from your home perspective look at the way we have food you know um, i must appreciate especially from the southern part of india that how you've been taught culturally to use hands you know uh, to take food whereas in northern part of india the spoon has already been a part of the extended dimension of this which somehow i personally feel can be relooked but irrespective of that the question is the eating food culture now a person who suppose doesn't have a grip uh, or has lost hands uh, or somebody who wheels in with an assistive device and doesn't have water to clean so how do you really provide support from design to manifest the culture of you know independence and inclusion in dining facilities as well looking at religion so when you look at religion religion also many a times though though it's a direction of your faith uh, but it induces certain cultural practices in you uh which we have to be sensitive about right so the question is do we as architects indulge in all this level to understand a user and if not the question is how can we really say that what we are designing is really working the biggest challenge in architecture friends is unlike amazon that we do not know who evaluates it yet because for us many a times it's the investor who is putting the money who is going to be the evaluator or the sole evaluator whereas in reality it is the evaluation has to be conducted by the users and they must have those privileges and rights i'm sure uh, the times have come that the public is also going to awaken itself and will soon demand these rights in a very inclusive way and when you start looking at uh, humans in terms of abilities you'll find that uh, we have many forms of abilities and it is the missing component of those abilities that we title them as disabilities but since we have a larger understanding of disabilities only as permanent ones you know it's important that <clears throat> it's important to this the temporary ones and the situation ones and here i pose 
one or two simulational perspectives to you, Fred. <clears throat> so I ask you this question, how able do you feel in doing certain things of your daily life, right? Maybe you say, I can do everything by myself. Great, wonderful. Imagine your parents uh, and imagine somebody aging or imagine yourself in a situation as good as just having fever, simple fever, right? 101 degrees Fahrenheit is the fever. What is your degree of ability now to perform the same tasks? Why is food given to you in bed? Why does somebody need to hold you to walk you to a washroom? Then why do you take leave from an institution where you just get one small fever? Because you start making a self-assessment that I would not have the ability to walk. So ability in that sense is basically a gut feeling. It's an internal experience. And also it's an ability which is given to you by the support environment that you have. So I may be down with fever, but sometimes I must say, no, my children love me so much, you know, I can't live without them. So I will get the ability to perform from them. <clears throat> many a times you've seen many such great feats have happened. So what I'm trying to say is just like this, so ability and disability are actually, you know, functions of human cognition or human mind, which can derive from the body and the other senses. And many a times you'll re recollect the quote by Miss Helen Keller, uh, who was the deaf blind lady who said, the sad part of the world is, you know, that we do have people who cannot see, but the problem is not with them. The problem is the ones who can see but lack vision, right? So I believe if we as sighted architects talk about this, we must not lose the vision to include people at any given point of life because please understand even when you understand the term parametric architecture <clears throat> the term parametric basically comes from the fact that every attribute of a built form element can actually be composed as a dynamic entity but the most dynamic entity of any environment is nothing but the human who can dynamically just imagine how many postures do you take in a day just imagine how many times do you walk and you're doing all these kind of things and how much do you speak, you know, are all acts of spontaneity and dynamism, right? But the question is our designs, which are usually static, a built form of floor and a built entire, entire urban space may last for like 20 years, 40 years, etc., without changing anything. So the question is how do different people with different abilities which we compose them as diverse forms, as unique people are able to adapt to that. Number third is the situational aspect. What about a situation having two hands full of <clears throat> baggages? And I'm sure you must have experienced that uh, when you go for shopping on MG Road and come back home and you have to get into an auto uh, with your both hands uh, with nice branded stuff. Uh, how do you get into it? Uh, how do you press the doorbell of your own home with your both hands are full? And what happens when you have to go to a washroom with the same bags? Right? So design is about also supporting situational contexts. And let me also add to this, what happens when you take bath in a shower and your eyes get some kind of soap into it and then you have to pick a shampoo bottle? Whether you pick a shampoo or a conditioner, how do you determine that? <clears throat> And have you ever tried, please try today if possible after 12.30 to rinse some soap on your hand and then trying opening a tap, right? And just see how does it work. It's as good as not having hand grips along with us. So the architect has to be sensitive about, you know, the largest of its scale, whatever comes under your, in the name of infrastructure to the tiniest of the elements, as I mentioned about the nail, which can matter as support to human abilities. So while I take examples of permanent disabilities here to talk to you, uh, it is the temporary and the situational which derive the maximum benefit out of it. And just to add to this friends, to let you know, so you, you must be reading about a little bit of policy as well. 
which may or may not be part of the curriculum, but it's important because it's part of the environmental function. So you'll find today India defines its number of disabilities as 21 types it, it classifies. Uh, before 2016, we classified only seven types of disabilities. Now we have 21 types. Uh, if you add to them, a lot of people who are undergoing temporary challenges, uh, there is a huge population of, you'll see, diabetes, huge population of cardiac patients, huge population of knee replacement surgeries, uh, pregnant women, elderly, etc. The, the reason I'm trying to tell you is this equation that you see, 21 types of disabilities plus other forms, equals to a huge population that becomes a dependent population, which is striving for inde independence, but it can achieve independence only if it is made interdependent on a phenomena called architecture. And that's the role that we have to play because they are invisible otherwise. You might not have seen all these people around it. Just imagine if some of us were deaf today, right? Uh, how would they have been participating in this webinar? <clears throat> I think the solution for that would have been, uh, I would have requested Professor Ganesh Babu to appoint one sign language interpreter and also provide a live closed captioning for the same so that what I'm speaking is also getting printed onto your screen, right? And this is how we would have included without making that person suffer. So I would say, let's, let's also understand there is a great amount of technology that exists today. So technology is not just a boon to show off that, oh God, that today I have an iPhone 11 Pro or something, etc. No, look at technology as an amazing enabler, but the enabling should be in such a way that one doesn't feel that I have to interface with technology so much. So that is how I think the beauty of architecture can be released. If you can embed technology with durability and resilience into it, that it can last for long, provide you the support, etc., without making the person feel. And this is where a theory comes into picture, which is even for interface technologies called universal design, right? So when you see these kind of disabilities, you'll find the multiple kinds. This is just one example I'm giving you. So when you classify a user, you know, uh, I look at user, we were taught that there is one user which is like an Vitruvian man around which the entire architecture must fit. I would say no, the users are of many, many types and we have to have specific understandings for all of them. I'm sure if you've done a kindergarten design before, the question is who judged your kindergarten, if not the children, right? Could you sensitize yourself to a child's eye? Have you seen what happens when you see the world from a two feet or a 95 centimeter height? There is a worldwide challenge, you know, which is called the 95 centimeter height challenge, you know. Look at the world from 95 centimeters high and then say, what does the world look like to you? I think we as architects, when we grow up, the sad part of the human being is that we forget the pains that we have ourselves gone through. So here I want to shift and bring into your design thinking an approach called the approach of empathy. And I wish in next one or two days, we are able to sensitize ourselves to certain levels that we can empathize a bit about what others feel when we design for them. Now, this is a role where again, technology can play a great role, but technology cannot play the role of, of kindling and sensitizing and awakening the soul of an architect. Technology can be an enabler from the outside, but you, unless you start feeling it, you would not even look at what is called as appropriate technology. To, to quote an example here, you know, we have amazing forms of wheelchairs available today, right? Ranging from 5,000 rupees to 5 lakh rupees, right? But the point is those people who actually need them cannot afford any of them. Even 5,000 rupee wheelchair is an unaffordable device for many people in this country. Now the question is, how do you resolve mobility challenges for them, right? And they face the challenge of going to their washrooms on everyday basis within their own homes. What about a lady who happens to be short height and happens to use a wheelchair for a moment? Uh, how does she use a kitchen? Have we ever seen in our housing designs how kitchens are actually manifested? At least elderly couples are going to use them. How do we look at uh, the design features in them? because we design the same house multiplied by a thousand times and call it housing, 
right? When we design workspaces, do we look at the needs exclusively? And you know, now the corporate culture has started understanding this even better uh, because now when women have joined the workforces even more, now they've started providing what is called as baby spaces, crashes, and many other things because you have to support families around it. And that is how you get more working hours from the youngsters these days. So, you know, these are concepts where you'll find inclusion is happening in terms of social outcomes of how societies are also changing. Please imagine, you know, 20 years back, we had enough times in our life that we would visit people's homes every Friday, Thursday or any other day. But today is a time when we have to ask 100 times to schedule an appointment. Then we also feel shy and then nobody wants us to actually visit homes. But we decide, OK, let's visit a common place where all of us can meet together, have food outside and then finish it. So we are a, a new culture, a new generation, a new time. And we need to adapt to the new forms of inclusion in different ways so that socially we remain inter interdependent while individually we try and pursue independence. <clears throat> Here I cite an example from a lady who I met, frankly speaking, in Bangalore. I was uh, invited by Accenture, I think, in 2017 uh, or 2018 uh, when I met Miss Deepa Malik. The lady you see is smiling uh, with the Arjuna Award and many other awards, I believe also the Padma Shri, uh, because she challenged life at every phase of her you know, uh, pursuit while she was on wheels. But why I bring her picture is from a narrative that I got from her in Bangalore. And what she said to me uh, on the stage was that, Mr. Gaurav, I, I find it very surprising that while wheel is a symbol of mobility and revolution for the world, <clears throat> it is the same wheel. When I sit on the wheels, people see me as disabled. Isn't that a big paradox of our society? And for all the more, you know, I'm also making this statement friends because we are close to an independence day and you see her wearing this flag of india on her badge because she's been a commonwealth uh, gold medalist and in javelin throw and in shot put and in many other um, <clears throat> athletic events you'll see the center of our flag is actually a wheel it's a wheel with 24 spokes isn't it what does that represent and it is about india's independence right so when you come on wheels, on one side we claim wheels, we are flying on wheels, we are going on scooties, we are going on skates, we are doing everything on wheels, right? And even we are talking about a bicycling society. But we design certain things that in which these four wheels somehow are not accommodated and they are looked at with a very different eye. The question is, can the architecture of future, can we as architects make that difference such that the first signboard that you saw as an entrance disabled could not be required and there is only just one main entrance from where everyone enters, be it on wheels, be it without the wheels, right? And that's a paradox to independence. So while we talk about independence, having independence is a very, very challenging thing. And these are the things that she tried to disprove by what she did. Another story was about this guy, Karthik Sani, right? I don't know if you've heard him. So who was denied admissions to IITs, uh, including any other institutions, because there was no exam which could test him because he was a child with vision impairment, right, who was blind. But what happened? So finally he appeared for an exam for Stanford and he got admission there. And now he runs a successful organization called iSTEM, I guess, from Stanford, which also works in India as well as I think in Bangalore, I guess. But what he said, you know, is that <clears throat> now how would you make him independent? He wanted to be independent by education, but the education was not accessible to him. Uh, here we would say it's not accessible to him because you're blind. So we are starting to find problem in the person. But on the other side, the problem is with our systemic architecture. It's a systemic infrastructure. It's a systemic support. So since we don't have that support system, we try and pass the buck on the individual. Now, this is where the role of architecture again comes very handy. Not that the architecture alone can solve it, but the point is, had the architecture of the support system been in place, you would not have to flee your own country for pursuing education. He could pursue. There are a million more who don't even see the light of the day to step out of their own homes. The question is, I would say, not that it has to be blamed on anyone, but the point is architects have to then take up very active social, public and life roles. 
unless we start getting into that, we would be not only out of the business, but we might be out of the minds of the people unless we contribute in a significant way which can change the impacts on human society. So friends, if you see this, I think uh, uh, I've already touched two minutes above this. <clears throat> uh, I just want to conclude maybe uh, on this point that the idea of disability becomes very, very sorry and sad when it comes to, you know, only people centric. Uh, and you'll find most people with disabilities are either seen from the eye of charity when we say, oh my God, what brought you in that situation? Or we look at them as heroes that, oh my God, he or she conquered the world and conquered the Mount Everest despite all these things. But whereas, what is it that the, these people are asking for or they need? If you are sensitive as an architect and a designer, I think all everybody is asking for is just being human. They don't want to be famous and they don't want to be undignified. Charity lowers the dignity and heroism puts them on a pedestal. They just want to be like you and me. The infamous people who can have their daily lives in a perfectly great way, who can have their jobs happily, smilingly, that's what the common people want. Does architecture benefit the common lives? And that is where the role of accessibility comes into, right? And these are the perspectives that I would <clears throat> leave you with and with a set of two questions, you know, uh, to think about, right? So these are examples. So this is how people would cross streets. This is how people would learn in schools. This is called the special education system. And this is how children, if you refer to these reports, uh, how much these children are suffering in the name of special education. And this is how we design. You know, this is a, a, a big ramp at the IIM Ahmedabad, the new one. Uh, and you see, of course, I know why it was done. This is, I think, inspired by the Milliners building where the Kobuzier uh, had designed a, a similar ramp straight to the first flight. While this built form still has a lift as well to go up, the point I'm trying to say is when you design flights like this, you know, with no mid landings, with um, the railings not extending here, it might be very challenging for a certain set of people to actually climb down and all those kind of things. So, you know, you'll have to look at all these questions. I think I'll, I'll jump uh, these slides for a minute to come to uh, a few questions for you and then you can break for the time, right? Uh, <clears throat> Friends, I want to basically ask you is the task one, if you can, uh, find out from your environment where you are already living in. It could be within your own homes or outside your own homes. If you can manage to have these six pictures, if possible, <coughs> it's okay if people can group and collect it also, it's okay for me. But I would say if it would be possible to have in the post lunch session, just these images, because images, to us would tell us a lot uh, where you can explain the idea of dependence and independence. On the other side, the idea of exclusion and inclusion. And on the third, what are the barriers that limit them and what facilitates that, right? So for example, it could be, have you observed somebody working in the kitchen? And a moment in that kitchen when you see dependence on something, and something that makes that person independent. It could be your mom, it could be your dad, it could be a sibling, it could be a grandmother or something. What about a washroom for that matter? What could be an assistive aid there? What excludes what it includes, right? What about your own housing society? What about your own street, which is just outside your own gate? Then you might have observed. So in case you cannot try and find something from a desk-based search, preferably from the city of Bangalore, because I really want you to connect to your environments that where you are living rather than something which is really far off. Because I think if our learning is shaped by our environments around us, the impact on environments that are going to come through your hands would be even more phenomenal, right? So I really urge if you can gather these images, I'll be very happy to have some you know discussion on this in, in post lunch session to interpret them. And the task two, maybe you can take an image of this and uh, look at it, identify an environment. It could be a space. By environment, I mean a space in which certain functions happen. <clears throat> so a street is an environment, a tree can be an environment, a park can be an environment, a kitchen can be an environment, a washroom can be an environment, a bedroom can be an environment. Map the elements of that, you know, because as architects, I know we quickly do plan sections, elevations, 
but I want you to map what elements are there. Can you make a list of them? And then I want you to actually experience in the next half an hour, if it's possible for you, choose one disability for yourself. Though by that, I don't mean that we are all very capable people. We all still have many disabilities. Even I have many. But choose a disability if you want to. And I would wish if you can choose <clears throat> to blindfold yourself or put something in your ears so that you can't hear anyone and pose as deaf. Or if you can be on your computer chair, which is can be a wheelchair and do everything on that in the next half an hour, right? and annotate the experience of that. You could shoot a small video, you could make a small picture of that and try and do everything that you would have done in that one, one and a half hour, have food on that, go to washroom on that, do whatever it is and experience it. Of course, when I say this with a word of caution, if you feel it is unsafe, please don't indulge into it. My intent is not adventure. My intent is uh, experience, right? Have we seen the space from these sensory experiences. And unless we have those experiences, how are we going to even design? I think we are not equipped to design unless we experience it. And number four is then list down what were the challenges. And number five and six, I would not wish to put too much pressure now, but you can think about it. How could you intervene? And number six would be, what are the learnings that we derive from this piece of design from this experience that we have shared with us, right? Yeah, 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 sir. We actually right? didn't get to know how, we, you know, these 90 minutes passed. It was so quick. Oh, I'm so sorry about that then. Uh, so please have a good filter coffee from my side and uh, let's join back around two. Is that fine? Yeah. Yes, yes. So um, and, and to all the youngsters who are listening to me, uh, please do it with a sense of uh, engagement and involvement, uh, with, but with no sense of pressure. It's okay if you can't manage to do it. It's okay. It's okay. I know because time is short, but the intent is if some of you can group together and do it, it will be great to have a nice interaction in the second half uh, so that post lunch we don't doze off, but actually take some learnings back out of it. Right. So I'm hoping to have some outcomes of this along with some previous design exercises if they have done so that we can revisit them and then I can also continue. There's much more I can share uh, and lots of more stories to talk about. So I look forward for that, friends, and uh, thank you so much for a very patient hearing. Over to you, Sana. Thank you, sir, for providing us with such a wonderful experience. I request all the participants, if you have any questions or you have views, your thoughts, your experience, you can raise your hand in the post lunch session and mm -hmm. ask your questions or you can also feel free to drop your question into chat box uh, however way you want to have it and then now after all this wonderful start i can't really wait for next session but now we have to break before we begin with our next session and which will begin sharp at 2 pm thank you all see you all at the post lunch session please I would request all the respected dignitaries and participants to kindly rejoin before time to ensure an uninterrupted session. Thank you.